Following the delivery of parts vital for the Little Boy nuclear bomb, the USS Indianapolis was sunk by a Japanese submarine. For the 900 or so who managed to survive the sinking of their ship, the ordeal was by no means over. What occurred next was the worst recorded shark attack in human history. Where as many as 150 men died as a result of being eaten alive by one of the top predators. Only 317 of the original 1196 crew would survive the nightmare at sea, stranded on life rafts in the open water. In today's video, we will cover the sinking of the USS Indianapolis and just what those who survived went through. On the 26th of July 1945, the USS Indianapolis delivered components for the Little Boy nuclear bomb, the device destined to level the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Much of the crew had no knowledge of the secret cargo they were delivering to the island of Tinian. The ship's next destination was Guam, where it would meet with other vessels and begin training for the planned invasion of mainland Japan. But on the 29th of July, the unescorted ship was attacked by a Japanese B-type cruiser submarine. The first torpedo that hit the ship destroyed the bow. The second torpedo struck the ship's powder magazine and fuel tanks, causing a series of explosions that tore the ship into two. It took only 12 minutes for the ship to sink. The initial explosions claimed around 300 lives, the remaining 900 or so making it to the life rafts, making flotation devices, or treading water in the open sea. Many without life jackets had to scavenge flotation devices from the dead. The survivors began to form groups in the water for safety and to try maintain some semblance of morale. They hoped that they would soon be found and rescued. This rescue, however, would not come until a number of days had passed. Not only did the survivors have to deal with a lack of drinkable water and the risk of exposure to the elements, but soon they would have to deal with sharks. A great number of oceanic white-tipped sharks had been drawn to the explosion and the blood from those wounded and killed. Oceanic white-tipped sharks are found in tropical and subtropical oceans throughout the world. They can grow as long as 11 feet and are regarded as predators at the top of the food chain. They are also, however, opportunistic eaters, known to prey upon squid, fish, other sharks, seabirds, and are even known to eat garbage. They are a primary component of shark feeding frenzies caused when mixed groups of predatory species feed together. In this instance, it is also believed that tiger sharks would join the white tips in feeding on the sailors. These two species are two of the few species of shark known to have killed humans. On the first night, the sharks feasted on the dead. But this only added more blood to the water, drawing even more sharks into the hunt. It is important to note that whilst many are thought to have been killed by the sharks, it was not the case that the survivors were beset by constant attack. It was, however, a constant worry, as the sharks would tend to go for those who drifted away from the larger groups or those on the edges of the larger groups. The men would maintain a shark watch to ensure no one in the group drifted away and attempted to ward off the sharks that strayed too close. Yet, still many men would be preyed upon and succumb to the harsh conditions. According to one of the survivors, We were losing three or four men each night and day. You were constantly in fear because you'd see the sharks all the time. Every few minutes, you'd see their fins. A dozen or two fins in the water. They would come up and bump you. I was bumped a few times and you never know when they're going to attack you. For those who died as a result of their injuries, exposure to the elements or dehydration, their bodies too would be preyed upon by the sharks. As more blood was spilled, the more sharks were drawn to the various groups of survivors. Another survivor stated, in that clear water, you could see the sharks circling. Every now and then, like lightning, one would come straight up and take a sailor and drag him straight down. One came up and took the sailor next to me. It was just somebody screaming, yelling, or getting bit. 
Whilst shark attacks was perhaps the most dramatic death, many more died as a result of their exposure to the elements. Even with their life jackets, many struggled to keep their heads above the water. Those with the life jackets would experience large blisters on their shoulders, ever exposed to the salt water. The groups of sailors would witness their comrades succumb to the madness of the situation. From the heat, the thirst and the trauma of the sinking, many turned to drinking the seawater. Another survivor said the following. Some of the men began drinking seawater so much that they became very delirious. In fact, a lot of them had weapons like knives and they'd be so crazy that they'd be fighting amongst themselves and killing one another. And then there'd be others that drank so much seawater that they were seeing things. They'd be saying, the ship is down below and they're giving out fresh water and food in the galley. And they'd swim down and a shark would get them. And you could see the sharks eating your comrade. It was only after four days and five nights that the first signs of hope arrived. A US Navy aircraft on a routine patrol flew overhead, which was able to radio in that there were many men in the water. If it wasn't for this accidental discovery, it's unlikely the survivors would have been rescued. This, however, was not the first indication that something had gone wrong with the USS Indianapolis. American intelligence had intercepted a message from the Japanese submarine that had torpedoed the Indianapolis. It detailed how it had sunk a ship that had been in the vicinity of the Indianapolis's route. This was dismissed as a ploy by the Japanese to create a trap. Nevertheless, USS Cecil Doyle was made aware of the situation and headed to rescue the survivors. Of the 900 men who survived the initial sinking, only 316 were left to be rescued. They were found drifted apart in a number of groups across nearly 200 miles of ocean. Among the survivors was Captain Charles McVeigh, who despite going down with the ship, had survived the ordeal. McVeigh was soon charged by the Navy for hazarding the ship and for not properly ordering the evacuation of his men. However, this second charge did not stick as the ship had sunk so quickly. Instead, the focus was on his lack of zigzagging to avoid the torpedo attacks. McVeigh was court-martialed and deemed responsible for the loss of the ship, although there is a level of controversy surrounding the whole affair. McVeigh had requested for a destroyer escort, though this was rejected, as the route was deemed safe at this point of the war. This was contrary to intelligence that suggested there was in fact a Japanese submarine in the area. In December of 1945, a dramatic and controversial decision was made. Commander Mochitsuro Hashimoto, the man in command of the submarine that sank the Indianapolis, was called in to testify that McVeigh had endangered the ship by failing to zigzag. However, much to the annoyance of the prosecutors, Hashimoto declared that the zigzag was a useless method of evasion and that he would have been able to sink the ship regardless of its maneuvers. McVeigh was nevertheless convicted. The only captain in the history of the United States Navy to be court-martialed for the loss of a ship sunk by an act of war. Although it was subsequently proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was little that McVeigh could have done to prevent the sinking, in part due to the various efforts started in the 1990s. But sadly, McVeigh would never live to see his vindication. He took his own life in 1968 in part due to losing his wife to cancer, and likely in part due to the hate mail and phone calls he received, blaming him for the loss of life. It was not until 2001 that he was fully exonerated for the loss of the USS Indianapolis, with much of the crew lobbying for decades to correct the record for their captain. There is also a level of controversy as to whether an SOS signal was sent and received. There are a number of servicemen who insist they receive distress signals and pass them on to their commanding officers. Yet, nothing was done for one reason or another, including one officer who was suspected of being drunk at the time. Despite the distress signals being sent and despite the non-arrival of the ship, little was done to rescue the survivors. It's important to note that despite this attack, sharks on the whole are a relatively peaceful bunch. There are only a handful of fatal shark attacks each year. 
For example, there were only nine worldwide in 2021. As for the sharks, as many as 100 million are killed each year. The white tip shark in particular is favoured as the key ingredient in shark fin soup, which is a truly despicable practice, and many more end up in the nets of commercial fishing boats. It is now thought that the white tip shark is close to being vulnerable to extinction, with estimates of around 90 to 95% of the population being depleted. Whilst it is certainly a disturbing and interesting story, it's important not to be caught up in any form of shark panic. What those men endured is beyond imagination, only made worse to be at the mercy of an apex predator in an environment that humans are not capable of surviving in. Only made worse to be at the mercy of an apex predator in an environment that humans are not capable of surviving in. Imagine being stuck at sea in the dead of night with the shark surrounding you as surrounding you as you